Like that. All right, here we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, friends and enemies, this is Pappy Come On Freeman, a black man in therapy, representing We Act Radio, here broadcasting live at the Victor L. Sullivan Gallery in Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> Brooklyn uh, Art Space uh, in uh, Northeast Washington, D.C. I'm joined by illustrious guest, uh, Mr. Ed Bazir, formerly of the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. Ed, you want to tell them what you uh, currently are uh, known for? Yeah, you could tell them what I'm currently what? Currently known for, you formerly known for <laughs> as executive director of D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute, the number one progressive think tank in the nation's capital, but please proceed. Thank you so much. Well, it was an honor to lead the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute for two decades and left when I ran for office, and now that I'm not employed, I'm free to be uh, active in politics, which in a way that nonprofits aren't, and been able to be really engaged in this campaign, supporting some really, really great candidates that I know we're going to talk about tonight. Unleash the Kraken. All right. Exactly. And we are basically here, as, um, as you see, this is um, entitled the D.C. Uninformed Voter Guide. Um, because oftentimes, we was talking about this off camera, that people go to um, the election polls and the conventional wisdom is that people have already made their minds up. But the reality is many of them uh, are just guessing because they don't know who's what. They, they, they make their mind up about a candidate, but they don't know anything about all the candidates. And they end up just willy-nilly checking off. And we think that the vote is too, too important. We think this election, every election is important, but this um, is including a, um, a mayoral race. I mean, this is the biggest election in, in I don't know, the longest, my, in my memory of being in D.C. in terms is of the opportunities. Right? The number is of, that because of the mayor's race, or is that because of uh, other factors in total? We have a big mayor's race. We have an attorney general's race. We have a big race here in Ward 5. We have a race in Ward 3. There's a contested race in Ward 1. And depending on the outcome of all of those races, the city could shift to be even more in the spirit of uh, change and addressing the city's deep inequities. It could also go in the other direction where we could go backwards. So this is just a super, super important. Well, question. when you put it like that, I, I see the fierce urgency of now, as Martin Luther King would say. Um, and with the, the fact that um, mayor, uh, our mayor, Madam Mayor Mira Bowser, ran unopposed the last time. That's right. And this time she has like the Wu Tang Clan right now. Uh, it's, it's a foot race, you know? It's a foot race. Uh, and so we're going to try to um, uh, break it down. Uh, I'm sorry we're not able to respond to your comments and questions in real time, but feel free to make those comments and questions. Hopefully, some of the people in our illustrious audience can respond to them. Uh, and we'll see what, what, what is, um, you know, throw it on the wall, see what sticks. But the fact of the matter is, you brought this up, you said um, the disparities in the city. Uh, I just think this, we need to establish some of the basic problems in the city as we go about addressing some of the uh, our opinions of the candidates um, that's running in this city. And I think one of the problems is that uh, D.C. has one of the greatest disparities of wealth uh, of any other city in America. Uh, it also has, um, you know, this is the most dangerous city for a black woman of any uh, social economic background to give birth in the entire country. Uh, and that speaks volumes because we have a, um, an African-American woman as mayor. Uh, we have uh, a literacy rate that's higher than a national average, and that's citywide. And if it's higher than the national average for the city, the poorest section of town means it's higher than that. So these are things that we need to talk about, and I bring that up to say this as a direct collect, um, connection between violence, crime, and literacy. These are some of the things that um, are glaring uh, to me. What are some of the problems that I think of uh, how your, your gender? I mean, I would just echo all of those. Uh, you know, we are a city that ever since home rule, every mayor has been black. So you can say this is a town that's had black leadership, but we still have uh, most black and brown students are not proficient on school test scores. We still have incredibly segregated schools where almost half of our schools are 90% black or brown. As you talked about the wealth gap where the average black family in this region has net assets of $3,500 compared to almost 300000 for white families, an 81 times gap. Mm. And there's no doubt that that incredibly low number for black households is the lasting legacy of all the policies, the employment discrimination, the housing discrimination, the education discrimination. And that's why this is a really urgent campaign because we have an opportunity to start to do more to undo those. 
And if we don't elect candidates who are eager to fight for change, who are not eager to fight for economic and racial justice, then those inequities are going to just continue. Well, there you have it. Um, and I think that because this is the nation's um, capital, I think everyone in the nation should be paying attention to what goes on in the nation's capital. Uh, I, January 6th. Uh, but, you know, we really need to um, recognize that the whole experiment of democracy, the American version of democracy, uh, is a fallacy when you are uh, faced with the reality that the nation's capital is only 68 square miles. And if the American experiment of democracy was true blue and could hold water, uh, you would think they would have gotten at least 68 square miles right. Like this would be the ideal city for schools, roads, and, and what have you. But uh, apparently it is not the case. Uh, it's reinforcing um, um, the, the disparities and uh, the status quo is uh, proof of that. So now, having that said, that's the nature of the problem. Let's get into some of the um, solutions or the people who think they have the solutions. Uh, again, this is Kimon Freeman representing We Act Radio. We're broadcasting here at the Victor L. Selman Gallery. And I, I would be remiss if I don't mention that this is a building owned by Art Space. Art Space is a wonderful organization that makes um, um, housing affordable for artists. Uh, it's an equitable arrangement that should be extended to those who are not themselves artists. And I just want to shout out Art Space. You can check them out at artspace.org for more information, and maybe you too can become an artist. You know, Picasso said that everyone's an artist until they grow up. Ah. <laughs> Someone beats it out of them or something. But so, artspace.org. I want to thank you because otherwise, I wouldn't be able to afford to live in the city. Yeah. There we have it. All right, let's take it from the top. We're going to talk about the mayor's race. And I'm just basically going to follow down the line of the um, D.C. Um, Board of Election um, ballot as it appears. Um, so I'm only reading the names as they appear. Um, I said let's start with the mayor's race, but on top of the ballot is the delegates. Um, uh, otherwise, we'll be our congressperson who doesn't have a vote, a vote or a, vote, a voice in Congress because we deny um, a vote and voice in Congress, but yet they decide what our budget is, is going to be and is, is approved or not, um, taxation without representation. Um, the first one on top of the list is a Wendy, her, says, her name is Hope Diller Hamilton. Who, who would vote for Hope Diller? You know, Obama was a Hope Diller. Yeah, what you got to say about that? I think Obama was a hope dealer. He was dealing in hope. He was, a, he was on the corner dealing hope. He was dealing in hope. Up with Just, hope. That's what that's Hey, Jesse that's Jesse. Said. Jesse was a hope dealer too. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to spend no time for hope dealer. We're done with hope dealers. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, and then of course uh, the last one is uh, Kelly McHale Williams. I don't know Kelly McHale Williams either. Do you have any information? I, I, I do not. I know Reverend Hamilton a little bit, and obviously we all know Eleanor Holmes Norton. I do not know the other candidate. Okay, so you know the Hope Dealer. All right, so okay. Eleanor, you know, it's kind of like Charleston Heston for my cold dead hands, you know. You're not going to get Eleanor Holmes Norton out of there <laughs> until one or two things happen. Either she dies, or would we get statehood, you know? And in that case, she would die the next day, <laughs> you know? Um, so anyone that's trying to run against Ellen Holmes Norton, you, you're, wasting, you're wasting your time. It's like, it's not gonna happen in DC. So you're gonna have to wait until her cold dead hands. I will say my good friend Kim Ford ran a, ran a good she, race I, against I think she ran the best ago. race. She I did. think she, I think she has been the best challenger. Kim Ford, ladies and gentlemen, was formerly the executive director of uh, Martha's uh, uh, Table. Um, she feels some kind of way about her exit yeah. from Martha's Table. She felt that Martha's Table was part of the nonprofit industrial complex. And for those who are unaware, um, that is a reference to um, folks who will want to address the problem but not solve the problem. Because in solving the problem, you eliminate your need for your organization to exist and the funding um, that supports that organization. So whether or not that's the case or not, but that's what she is asserting. All right? And it does exist. It does exist. <laughs> it does exist. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It does exist. All right, now let's get to it. Uh, the mayor's race. And again, I'm only going in order as the names appear on the ballot. Um, we have this guy named James Butler who seems to run every, he runs, he runs, he's on the treadmill. He runs for mayor uh, every, every um, election, uh, seems like, for the past few elections. I don't know anything about James Butler. I haven't heard him speak. Uh, I don't know his. He's the what candidate? He wants more, more police. James Butler wants more police. Hey, baby, come on, welcome. You know, find a chair. We got we have Fremois on the table. Have a seat and join us. 
We got the last studio artists here in Brooklyn, the Victor L. Uh, Selling uh, Gallery uh, joining us. Uh, he wants more police. Now let's talk about that issue for a second. Now the, the, the safest communities does not have the most police. DC has more police per capita than any other city in America. In fact, any other area of, in America outside, as far as I know, uh, the Diamond District in New York City. But absolutely, to yeah. I mean, it, it sort of puzzles me that uh, when you have a problem uh, in existing situation, people are unhappy with public safety. And we have a lot of police that they think that the solution is more police, when in fact there's just no evidence that more police makes a difference. As you said, we have more police per capita than any other city. And when we spend money on police, $500, $600 million, that's clearly money that we're not spending on youth, we're not spending on affordable housing, we're not spending on after school programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been in DC for almost 40 years and I've been hearing for almost 40 years that there's this magic number of 4,000 police officers. You heard it well talked about in this campaign. It's not based on any analysis. It's just a number that's pulled out of thin air. And so people uh, are just, aiming for I hope it's air, not the other end. <laughs> you, you, you can talk about that if you like. But yeah, it's, it is a, it's an arbitrary number, uh, and it's not tied to safety. And people are not really talking about what's going to keep us safe. You know, um, uh, I think it's a, uh, a fitting analogy of a grease fire, and you throw more water on it. Yeah. Because you're not recognizing it's a different kind of fire. Yeah. Okay? Yes, normally you have crime, you call the police. That's the normal fire. But when you have a fire that's caused by illiteracy, uh, poverty, hopelessness, and, and, and uh, ignorance, and, and, you know, these other social ills, that's not your typical police issue. Mental health is not your typical police issue. So obviously, we have to deal uh, with this different type of fire a different type of way. And I think that's what your, your point is making. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just such a shame that, that two years after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were murdered, and people were like all about police reform or reducing the size of the police and shifting to non-police a ways to keep us safe. That we just sort of forgot about that. Man, even our president, you know, um, last last year he was saying George Floyd changed the world, and then this year he can't even say um, defund the police. Yeah, you know, he said fund more police. You know, um, uh, but you know. So yeah, I mean, I'd much rather we talk about what's going to keep our community safe, what's going to address the the causes of violence, as you talked about, illiteracy, hopelessness, unemployment. Lack of opportunity. I mean, it's not rocket science for me. I tell people all the time, if you look anywhere around the world, anywhere around the world, if you see a lot of poverty, you're going to see a lot of crime and violence. If you see a lot of wealth, you're going to see a lot of peace and tranquility. You know, so it's just basically give the people what they want. If there was a guaranteed income, a safety net that people couldn't fall beneath of, then I think it would be less people knocking other people in their head trying to take their stuff. Yes. So, and you know, you and I are talking about it. we're on the same page. Just to make clear, people should be looking for which candidates are talking about that the solution to public safety is more cops or those who are brave enough to say no. It's a much more nuanced conversation, and then in fact, more cops takes us in the wrong direction because it's spending money that's not going to make us safe, and in fact, will create more black and brown targets in in you know people in their own communities being targeted by. By government employees. Should that be a flatbed issue for the evening that anyone that's saying more police needs to don't get it? I mean, I would, absolutely. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean definitely. That's I, I certainly would want everyone to be looking at their candidates and asking that question. Absolutely. Is, is the solution to public safety more police or is it is it something else? Yeah, I mean, I mean, because you, you're ignoring the fact of how many times we've seen instances of, of, of um, police brutality, police violating people, um, and you haven't even acknowledged those issues. In fact, I would be remiss if I don't mention this, because, uh, you know, uh, our hope dealer, um, Barack Obama, and two black attorney generals uh, ignored this. In 2006, the FBI report, FBI report, not the We Act Ready report, the FBI report said that law enforcement has been quote unquote infiltrated by white supremacists. And so there you have it. They said it. I didn't look it up. No one has addressed it. And you just want to throw more um, water on a grease fire. You know, one of my uh, sad memories from my prior work at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute was the city had just wrapped up its budget process, but then our chief economist came out with an announcement that the city had a ton more money than it had thought, and there was just all this opportunity to invest in schools, in affordable housing, in recreation, but the same weekend that that 
uh, announcement was made, there were two or three high profile murders, and two days later the council put every single penny of that additional money into cops. None of it into housing, none of it into schools. And that's, that's the kind of council members we don't want. And, and, and definitely don't need. All right, so James Butler, hands, thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs down from the audience for James Butler. <laughs> All right, now we have the incumbent, Madam Meryl Bowser. Now, it would be real easy to throw rocks at, at Meryl Bowser because, you know, she, she's on the top of the hill, you know, uh, and everyone's trying to take the crown. I understand that. Um, but I want to first start by thanking her for something that I think she did well. I think it was a great idea uh, for her to um, clap back at Donald Trump and create Black Lives Matter Plaza, okay? Uh, I think that's going to be a lasting um, um, legacy of hers. Uh, yes, it's full of symbolism. Yes, it's full of symbolism. But but we need we need symbol we need symbolism sometimes. And so we get the, we get we get feedback from the audience because it's Black Lives Matter Plaza and black people still getting their ass whooped by the police at Black Lives Lives Matter Plaza. I understand that. But the fact is is that the, the address for the White House is now 1600 Black Lives Matter Plaza. I mean, we gotta take, we gotta, some of these, are, you know, we gotta acknowledge is, is, is significant. And for me, I think that's some, some significant symbolism. So I wanna thank her for having the audacity um, to create um, Black Lives Matter Plaza. And it's gonna be, a, it's, it, it was beautiful in 2020 to see everyone coming down to visit that. It was an attraction, it was a new national attraction and she's preserving it. So I just wanna say thank you for that. I think she got that right. And I also think she did a decent job in handling the pandemic, you know? Um, those are two things I can think of. I'm running out of stuff to thank her for, so that's what I can think of. But I turn it in. Anything you can thank her for? Uh, I will say uh, I am not supporting the mayor for re-election, but in her first term, she did really take, make it a top priority to, to close the D.C. general shelter for fam homeless families uh, and to replace it with smaller, kinder, more humane, decent facilities in every ward in the city, including in Ward 3, and she got a lot of pushback. She put a lot of political capital into that. And we now have uh, facilities in every single ward that are small, they're decent, families have privacy and dignity in a way that DC General was just, you know, the total opposite. So I do give her a lot of credit for that in, right. in her first term. All right, so um, we, we want to start there. So now we can get into the nitty gritty. Right. <laughs> now, hard, hard, she, this, is, this, is, this is, she's completing her second term. Um, she's the first woman to have two terms as mayor. She is potentially, uh, this race would decide whether or not she would be the only other mayor that had three terms. Um, what do you say about her chances in, in, in the race? What is it, what is it you think is the, her um, outlook is right now? So my, my personal take is, given what you just said, in DC, if you want a third term as mayor, and the only person who's done that is Marion Barry, is you really have to show that you've done a lot in your first two terms, right? You, if you're, the voter's gonna say, we wanna give you a third term, you have to say, oh, she's really done a good job, and, and that's, that's how I judge, and, and I don't think she's done a really good job. When we look at what's happening in our schools where under mayoral control, which she takes credit for having mayoral control, performance, particularly for black and brown students, has not improved an affordable housing crisis that has not gotten better and we're building a lot of affordable housing that we're calling affordable even though it's targeted to people with incomes between fifty and hundred thousand dollars not to those below fifty thousand dollars we have issues of homelessness where rather than recognizing that tent encampments are a sign of, of shame and a problem and a lack of affordable housing and a lack of mental health services and shelters that aren't safe forcibly removing people from their only home when their only home is a tent. I think it's for me, talk about symbols, one of the worst symbols of where our city has ended up. And the mayor continues to clear out tent encampments to this day, rather than- I think that's a national, I think that's a national trend as well. But, but there is also a history, of, we can talk about it when we get to the more than one race, of dealing with tent encampments in a different way because the tent encampment, it's not that we want people to live in tents, we want them to live outside. But we also don't want to remove them if that's their only home. And the, the right way is to work with, build trust with the people who live in those encampments, connect them to services, and don't, don't close an encampment unless everyone has actually left. You, you clear the encampment after everyone has gone into housing or some alternative, rather than forcibly removing them on I mean, I mean, Slim, can you imagine you're homeless 
and you in your tent, and someone takes your tent. Or, or scoops you up while you're in your tent. You know what I'm saying? So, bulldozer. you sleeping on that bench, or you sleeping on the ground, okay, whatever. But you have a tent. How dare you? We can't have that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, that's just, just the reality of that. Yeah. It's just heartbreaking. I, I have not attended one of the forcible tent encampment removals, but from those who've been there, the accounts, it's just, it's incredibly traumatic, even just as a witness, because people's, all of their things are being thrown away. Uh, their tents are being thrown away, often their possessions are being thrown away, even though the, the, the message is that they're not, but people are losing their stuff, they are being tra traumatized because they don't know where they're going to go, and it's just, again, a sad and, and I, and I, I just want to advocate on behalf of the homelessness for just a second longer. Um, one of the things that never occurred to me, because um, you hear people say, oh, why don't they just get a job? Okay, well, they just toss your tent, like you said, and all your belongings. The chances are you don't have your ID or your, your resource, and you can't get a job without an ID, you know? Uh, you know, and have, and if you don't have money, you can't. You might not be able to get, get to the job on the, um, through the metro or, or what have you. So, like, you're really in a, you know, in a, um, a bad place or what they call a rock and a hard place. Uh, but I just want to put that out there because we're not really addressing the issues. I think again, it's another grease fire. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, the uh, Madam Mayor Mayor Bowser, um, thumbs up, thumbs down on the third term. Okay, we're going down and down the list. You know, thumbs up in the so, house. So we have, should we talk about who's running against her then? Yeah, we are get, absolutely be going down the list. Okay, the next on the list is Treyon. <laughs> he done went from Treyon Ward 8 white to Treyon Washington DC white. Okay, let me give, let me give Treyon a little shout out, y'all. Hold on a second, because he needs some, he needs some support. Why did they do Treyon District of Columbia? All right. So I, I just I just want to give a, give Trey a little shout out. You know what I'm saying? Give a little shout out. He needs some support. And the reason I do that is because we act radios in in Ward Eight. Um, Treyon is councilman for Ward Eight, and um, I think that he's um, the underdog clearly in this race. Um, and we act radio has been is the underdog in the media race. Uh, so I just want to always root for the underdog, you know, uh, and I think he's been very good in representing the, uh, the, the issues important to the lump and proletariats in, in this city. Uh, but he has shot himself in the foot as a citywide candidate, um, unfortunately, so he's, he doesn't have the traction that's going to be necessary to um, um, pull him forward. And the only thing that I wish had had happened was that, you know, the, the challengers um, that we respect, you know, Treyon and, and Robert, had come to some understanding and agreement. Um, Robert just obviously the stronger candidate, citywide candidate, and if he had um, Treyon's support, may, um, um, would only serve to um, uh, improve his chances. But I think there's another argument for ranked choice voting here, um, choice because voting. How, it's very hard for uh, a candidate to, un to un unseat an incumbent, and you split in the opposition vote. Uh, so, uh, Treyon just gets my moral support, <laughs> gets my moral support, um, but I think he's young, I uh, don't think he's um, um, as viable citywide candidate as, as Robert. I, I got nothing to add to that, I agree with everything you said. I think the, the real race is, is uh, the incumbent and, or Robert White. Okay, but Treyon, I still love you bro, I was rocking the shirt, I gave you a shout out. All right. Um, so, Robert White, I was with... Um, uh, Listen Local First uh, organization had um, a meet and greet with Robert White last night in Tacoma Park. Um, had uh, opportunity to speak to him um, directly, and he seems fired up. Uh, and he's he's gonna, he's going to sprint to the finish line. And it just occurred to me that wow, what if he wins? Yeah. It like really just dawned on me last night to talk to him. Like, he actually thinks he's going to win. And I'm like, what if he does win? What does that mean? And if he doesn't win, what if him and Treyon combined gets more votes than Merrill? Another argument for ranked choice voting, because that will eliminate that. So I'm going to throw those two, two scenarios out to you, and then we'll get into some of the um, issues on this platform. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a race where it's, it, 
either candidate could win. And uh, so, yes, I, I very much like the idea of what if Robert White were to win. And, you know, for me, uh, I just think about trying to boil down the campaign to a handful of issues that are easy for people to understand. I'm reminded of Janice Lewis George's campaign two years ago where she just told voters about three things that Brandon Todd did that hurt not just her community but her family as well, taking away TOPA rights, not supporting Initiative 77, and there was a third thing that I'm now blanking on, but it just made it clear to voters about what the race was about. And so the, among the things that are on my mind is the fact that last year the D.C. Council voted to raise taxes primarily on millionaires and they used the money to raise wages for early child care, early childhood education workers who currently make about minimum wage. They used it to help thousands of people move from tents into their own homes. And they used it to support greater income support for working poor families. Robert White voted for that tax increase. And as soon as the council passed that tax increase, the mayor wrote a letter to the council saying, please don't do this. That got by me. I didn't know that. That's right. And, and that to me is just a really important division. And on a similar note, Robert White helped champion legislation to dramatically reform and improve early childhood services for all kids in the city by making sure that every child has high quality early childhood education. And we know from common sense and research that if you get kids off to a right start, it, it sends them well for the rest of their life. And if you don't give them off to a good start, it hampers them for the rest of their life. So he championed that legislation, he fought to fund it. And again, the mayor said, no, I don't want to fund this program. So, well, having said that, uh, this um, uh, reminds me that during the election campaign, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Mira Bowser, uh, had supported, proposed um, uh, a guaranteed income for young mothers in the city. Y'all hear about this? Y'all hear about that? Yeah. She, was, she was getting, there was attacking her saying that she was paying, um, 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 you know, unwed mothers to have babies. Uh, but the reality is, we have a, I told you it's the most dangerous city for a black woman, any social economic give birth. Uh, we also have a high inf infant mortality rate. Uh, there's no, uh, there's very little uh, 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 health, um, what's it, OBGYN services outside of Northwest. There's no hospitals, full service hospitals outside of Northwest. So there's very little child care and, uh, um, uh, and, and women health care available to them. So I think they deserve it. But she did it during an election, an election campaign. So fast forward from now to, to when she wrote the letter, I think that's some indication that maybe perhaps she's getting it now and she's feeling the heat a little bit and she's want to make some overtures to a progressive community. What do you think about that? Uh, well, yeah, definitely some overtures, but, you know, again, for me, the question is, uh, and part of the reason I think voters are confused is that a lot of people running for office say, quote-unquote, the right things. They, they say things that they know voters want to hear, and they, then... They hope dealers. They, they are hope dealers <laughs> on the corner. <laughs> but the real question is, when the heat is on, when, you're, when the pressure is there, when you have to make a tough call, because, of course, everyone would say, let's make sure every child has a good school and every child has, every family has affordable housing, but when that actually means that you have to push back against developers, that means when you, when you have to ask rich people to contribute more, do you have the courage to do the right thing there? And so, uh, to me, actions in office speak louder than campaign pledges. Ooh, say that again, brother. Yeah, say I like that. that. Actions in office speak louder than campaign pledges. You know, it's been said that when they um, when they they um, campaigning, they campaign in poetry. Yes. And when they run, I mean, when they and when they in office, they they govern in prose. Oh, okay. There you go. I I read. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, Robert White, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thumbs up, thumbs down. What we doing? Oh, looks like well, we got a six on the fence, but it's a majority. Okay, all right. All right. We, we here? You got a question on it? Got a question? Got a question on us? Well, I wish I had been here when you all were discussing James Butler. James Butler wants more police, and he's putting water on the grease fire, so we don't, we, we got thumbs down on James Butler. James Butler, thumbs down. We quickly changed your opinion. Now he, he just conv he, he convinced me last night that he thinks he's he can actually win, and when 
and that's when it entered my mind that what if he does win? Because the general assumption is they're splitting the opposition vote. So it's going to be very difficult. It would be easier if it was a single candidate. But um, if, oh, let's touch on this. Eh? Do you think uh, a low voter turnout is supportive of the incumbent? Or do you think a high voter turnout is in support of, of the incumbent? Which scenario, which voting scenario um, do you think would be um, most least advantageous to the incumbent? Now, let me be paraphrase. Heritage Foundation um, says that they don't want people to vote. They, they want low voter turnouts, and that's how they maintain power. Okay, that's the Heritage Foundation, who now has a black woman heading the Heritage Foundation. So you can look that quote up and you can see it for your own self. I, mean, I, I think a high voter turnout is a sign that people want change. And so high voter turnout is something that scares incumbents. They, they would much rather people stay home because the people who are coming out are the people who just vote every single time. And because they voted every single time, they remember, oh yeah, I voted for Muriel twice. So I'll just vote for her again. Okay. So... Do we think there's going to be a high voter turnout or a low voter turnout for this race? I mean, I think the fact that we have a competitive mayor's race, competitive attorney general's race, competitive race in Ward 5, Ward 3, we're going to have a much higher turnout, certainly than four years ago when there just yeah. that weren't, you know, mayor didn't have an opponent. And she ran out of so it's going, to, it's going to be a good turnout. All right, there we have it. What's that? It depends on who turns it de up. It, de it, de it depends on who turns yes. out. All right, so show up and turn out. Okay. All right. Now we move right along to the chairman of the council. Something you know about Ed. Oh, man. We have Aaron Palmer. I don't know about Aaron Palmer, but I'm pretty sure you do. I love Aaron. Aaron is just uh, an amazing person. So she is a. Is she truly an amazing person, or is she just running against the guy that you ran against? No, she's an amazing <laughs> person. She's just a really decent person. She she, she lives in Ward Four. She's an ANC commissioner. She's an ethics lawyer. She's a mom of three kids, and she's been an active mom while campaigning against Phil sure. Mendelssohn. Her heart is in the right place. Among other things that I love about her is that she's not just on the issues right, but she's also got that nerdy, I just want the council to work better, which is an issue that's also important to me. The fact that right now the council doesn't really take up, they don't have a research arm to really look into the issues in, in any depth. Uh, they don't really, they never think about the reforming the processes to, to improve and, and that's the first thing that she wants to do is actually just have a more effective council. I have, I have to say this, um, the D.C. Council before 2014 never heard of a community land trust. Exactly. And I'm like, how do I know more than you do? And every state legislature has a research arm to like think about, understand, lift up new issue ideas, new and alternatives. We also have a, um, a law in the books called DOPA, the District Opportunity Purchase Out Act, which enables the government to actually uh, intercede and intervene in um, uh, anything that displaces um, so, uh, anything of value in the, in the city. It's just that they don't think too many of us of value and they allow it uh, to go on and they, they've never used it for 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, we at Grail is one of the rare instances where they implemented that. Uh, shout out to um, uh, Robert That's White and <laughs> Kenya McDuffie and those that got, got that uh, happen for us. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. So Aaron um, is obviously your choice uh, for the uh, council. And for those outside of uh, the D.C. area, um, we ran by a mayor and 13 members on the council. And the chairman of the council is probably the second most powerful person in the city. Yeah. Um, so that is the structure. 13 council members and a mayor and the council chairman is the number two spot. And that's what we're talking about right now. We have, we have a comment from the audience. We got something from the audience. I, I support Aaron because she's the only one who's put up her first plan was how she would reduce the power of the position she's trying to get. Reducing the power of the position she's vying for. To share power. That's a new concept. She's saying that it's too powerful of a position and more of it should be interesting. See, I, she well, tried I, to, I didn't even say that. Wow, yeah. she's democratizing the position. Okay. Yeah. All right, they basically saying that uh, she felt that the, uh, the, the, the challenger feels that the second position in the city is too powerful and she wants to democratize I have a shared uh, power uh, of that position. Uh, okay, I don't, just what would that look like? What, are the, what would that look like? I mean, right, so I'll give you one example. I mean, I don't know if this is what Aaron has She, she doesn't want to be Jack Evans. <laughs> Who does? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, right now... Hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back, no. No more. So, right now, the way the, right now, the way the budget process works is hundreds of people testify before the D.C. Council. They raise lots of great ideas. Every single council member has hours and hours of hearings. They mark up their budget. But then, the day before the final vote on the budget, the chair of the D.C. Council, Phil, for the last eight years, essentially does whatever he wants to do. I mean, he has to please his colleagues to some extent, but he just pulls things out of thin air in the last minute, and, and then we'll share that budget with the council and say we're going to vote on this in four hours. And honestly, that's the way it happens in a lot of states where one person has a lot of power, but that's too much power. And that's what maybe Aaron's talking about. Yeah. One of the many Yes. Yeah. And he had the whole lot. Yeah, oh, we got a question on this, I'm sorry. That With Phil? Uh, hippie environmental lawyer. He might have been. I mean, he used to smoke weed, if that's what you mean. <laughs> it's a picture of him getting arrested. Yeah, we well, feel, it's, feel it's why he calls weed. himself a progressive because of some memory from 20 years, 20 years ago, yes. More than 20 years ago. Which is probably why he got such a, a, a thing in his ass about um, the cannabis industry in this city. I'll just give one other quick example, though, which is that um, in his campaign, Phil's been talking about moving paid family leave legislation through the council, when the reality is it passed and then he immediately tried to undermine it because of corporate pressure. He tried to repeal and replace it, just like Republicans tried to re repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And he's taking credit for it while Aaron Palmer was on the other side of the debate fighting to protect paid family leave. And paid family leave, by the way, is if you have a baby, if you have a sick relative, if you yourself are sick, you can take time off from work and get almost all your wages replaced. And and <laughs> who how, how can you argue against that? It's like this. So, so Phil Mendelson, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs down. All right, Phil, you got a rough road ahead. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, big money, big money's on Phil though. What's that? Big money's on Phil. Yes. Well, you know, if that's if, if we could take a diversion there. One of the. One of the really uh, unfortunate, I would say maybe even evil aspects of our campaigns is the, the influence of Democrats for education reform, DEFER. This is the group that spent money trying to get uh, to defeat Janice Lewis George two years ago because she said, let's have a more sensible approach to public safety rather than more cops. Fortunately, those ads that they sent came out just as George Floyd was murdered by a cop and it backfired on DEFER and they had to apologize, but they're back in force this year. They, they bring outside money from the Walton Family Foundation and others, conservative money, they bring hundreds of thousands of dollars into DC races and try to influence the outcomes. And one of the people that they're spending a lot of money on is uh, is Phil Mendelson, also also the mayor and uh, also one of the candidates in Ward Three that we'll get to. They're scared. they're scared, and it's but it's just you know we have a we have public financing which allows almost anybody to run and mount a good campaign, but it's hard to win when corporate conservative forces from outside of D.C. are pouring in literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to influence our races. Well, you know, um, as I said before, you know, this is D.C. and politics looks uh, different here. For example, um, the mayor uh, had um, a stand-in for um, Ward 8 uh, when Mayor Barry died. And when she ran um, against Trey, uh, she had outspent him like like, a lot, a lot, like like ten to one, like spent, you know, and he still won. Yeah, and they were scratching their heads on that. Like like national um, um, uh, folks was looking, was watching that campaign because that was a shot. That was shots fired across the bow. We, we hope people aren't fooled this time by DC. Yeah, because generally um, in the past, people just count count lawn signs. You know, who had the most lawn signs? That's who they pretty much go for. And I think that's changed somewhat. And um, so shout out to Trey with that. Um, so now let's move on to the at-large um, council race. Um, on the top of the ticket for the council uh, at-large council race, and again for those outside of DC area, we've got 13 council members um, representing um, uh, eight um, eight wards. So you have eight council members, uh, each representing one ward of the city, and then you have four at-large. That's am I correct? Keep going. Four at-large. Because um, I've been drinking the, um, the good friend Wild, I want to make sure we, we correct here. Um, four at laws to citywide, and then of course you have the council um, uh, chairman. And so on the top of the ticket for one of those at large, 
uh, is Lisa Gore. I'm not familiar with Lisa Gore. That's not my 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 uh, pick. Do you know anything about Lisa? Uh, Lisa Gore lives up in Ward uh, Four, I think. Is Ward? Yes, Ward yeah. Four. She's an ANC commissioner. Uh, she is a former federal government official, like and worked with the Inspector General, I think, with HUD. So she understands housing. She understands um, accountability. Uh, she has a son who's got um, special needs, and so she's also very much focused on school accountability. And she is. She is a very popular candidate. As we'll get to, there are three really good popular candidates who are all trying to defeat one not, not very good incumbent. Yeah. But Lisa is one of those challengers. Is Lisa, is Lisa your pick? Uh, I really love and respect all the, the three people who are challenging Anita Bonds, and so I have, am just, uh, I'm not speaking out in favor of one of them over in the other two. Okay, I'm going to go with my man, Nate Fleming. Nate Fleming. Nate Fleming. Do we have any comments from the crowd about Lisa Gore? Uh, Lisa Gore, thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up. We got some excitement in this room. She supports CLTs. She supports Community Land Trust. Community Land Trust? All Who right. doesn't support Community Land Trust? <laughs> it's the fad now. And we need you guys to also support Community Land Trust. Go to douglascommunitylandtrust.org. That's douglasclt.org. You can become a member. And if you're unfamiliar with the Community Land Trust, just go to We Act Radio's YouTube channel and put in Community Land Trust, and you'll see us run the voodoo down. And it actually came about during the Civil Rights Movement. It was produced, um, the concept was produced uh, as a result of sharecroppers being displaced when it was exercising their right to vote. And so Albert King, uh, the little brother of Martin Luther King, who also died on, sus on suspicious circumstances, by the way, um, um, uh, spearheaded um, some of the first community land trusts in, in this, this country. So uh, please go to We Act Radio YouTube channel, subscribe, and uh, put in uh, community land trust in your search engine if you're unfamiliar. All right. Um, Nate, Nate Fleming. So we're going to Nate Fleming. We had um, uh, a majority support for Lisa Gore from the um, the audience. There, we, we have a lot of we have a lot of love for Lisa in this audience. Man, yeah, okay, and and she deserves. She sounds like a wonderful lady, she's, but she's I don't know know you that well. Uh, please become a member of Douglas Community CLT org. But I'm gonna roll with Nate, who I do know. Uh, Nate, uh, some of y'all should know him because he was uh, robbed at gunpoint. Uh, he was robbed. I'm dropping money. He was robbed at gunpoint, uh, carjacked, and even after that, he didn't scream more police. He's not. He's he's one of those people who's like, we do not need more police. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's also uh, he's our former shadow representative. He ran for DC council, I believe, eight years ago, and got some strong endorsements. Then did not win. And for the last several years, he's worked as a legislative staff person for uh, Councilmember Tram White. So hopefully the the. Um, uh, the race would nail down between Lisa and um, and Nate. They both sound like viable candidates um, for the position. Anita Bonds, unfortunately, um, is a, a, an elder who I think has um, it's like capitalism has helped outlived her usefulness, and she represents um, a rubber stamp from uh, uh, the mayor's office. Uh -huh. So, so you know, she's the head of the housing committee. What can you tell me that she's done around community land trust? Does she does she know what they are? I don't know. Prior to 2014, I can tell you she didn't. But um, I don't I don't know what her dismal record is um, pro, um, since that time. But we need to point out the fact that there was a housing trust fund. There was some um, corruption around that. There was some misuse of funds around that. You know anything about the, the, the oh, uh, yes. housing I mean, trust fund? There's just a, there's just a lack of oversight. So. There's a scoring process when, when developers apply to get money to build affordable housing. There's a scoring process to decide which projects are best and which cost efficient, serving the right people, etc. And then the department that oversees it doesn't necessarily award the money to the top vocators. They just can look at the list, which obviously smacks a favoritism, right? If you are getting a low score in the review process and you are getting money from the city to build housing, then clearly something's wrong there. It's also the case that the Housing Production Trust Fund a big chunk of the money is supposed to serve DC's lowest income families, the people who are most at risk of displacement, and yet year after year after year they violate that part of the law and shift the money towards people with more moderate incomes. I have heard this analogy that DC government is an Uber driver and the developers just call up the Uber and tell them where the car was going to go. I mean, you know, that's, that's a very quick way to summarize the auditor's very long report about misuse of funds in the Housing Production Trust Fund. Where are we going and how far are we going to go? Yeah.
and how so, much are you going to get paid for this trip? You know, I, I was part of a, either a debate or an interview with Anita Bonds, who's been the head of the housing committee for at least four years, maybe longer. And she said, you know what I think the city needs is a housing plan. And I was like, but wait, haven't you been running the committee that deals with housing for at least four years? Where could that plan be? Or where, why isn't that plan there now? And why aren't we, for example, supporting stronger rent control? Because for those in the audience, DC has rent control. Rent control has created stable rents for lots of people in the city. But rent control stopped basically in 1975. The last, the only buildings that are covered by rent control are those built in 1975 or earlier. And I don't know, I think there's been a few buildings built in DC since then, right? Well, I'm a child of the 70s, and one of the other things that happened in the 70s is that the, um, um, the real wage increases stopped in America in around 78, which means that we have the money that we had in 78, we have the same purchasing power um, then now. And you see how, how much everything else has gone up. Right. Rents are rising, wages are. That's right. And this is why this is unsustainable and we need to get right down to the nitty gritty. All right, I get right down to the nitty gritty. Did you, I hope y'all flip that cake before y'all start cutting into it. All flip right, it over. I hope you just still, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should, yeah, you should flip it over. Yeah, it tastes yeah. a lot better. So we need a bottle. And it's a rum cake. I thought you didn't drink. <laughs> he said he doesn't drink, but he can eat the rum cake. Fair, fair enough. All right, so the audience, thumbs up, thumbs down. Need a bonds. Any thumbs up for Anita Bonds? No, no, no status quo in the house. And then we have some dude named Dexter Williams. Dexter Williams. He's Dexter not, Williams. What do you know about Dexter? He's not just some dude. He's good. He's been really active in an organization called DC for Democracy, which I'm a part of and a, a member of the leadership of. And probably the thing that Dexter is most famous for is being one of the lead advocates for public financing of elections in the city. Okay. Dexter Williams deserves a lot of credit for the fact that I ran last two years ago. I was able to get public financing and so many other people uh, this year. I think year that's very progressive. Financing. I think that's very. Tell them about public financing. Yeah, I mean, the way public financing works in the city is you as a candidate have to agree to, to take only small dollar donations. If you're running in a race in a ward, uh, $50 is a maximum donation. Can't take any money from corporations, from PACs, from unions. But in return for limiting yourself to small dollar donations, every donation you receive is matched five times. So a $50 donation turns into $300. And that means that really anybody, even if you don't have a big, long list of wealthy people to ask uh, money of, uh, you can be a first-time candidate, you can be someone who's young, whatever it might be, you can raise enough money to run a real race. And I give Dexter Williams a lot of credit for that. And he's just, he's a first-time candidate, and I think he's just uh, done a really good job of putting himself out there. Okay, uh, we moving to Ward Two, and I'm having trouble. No, well, there's not nothing in Ward Two. I think we're in Ward Three. Yeah, Ward, there's one, three, and five. I'm looking at the yeah. ballot here. I don't see a Ward Two, so that's why. That's good. Maybe. Really? Yeah. There's there's no uh, the Ward Two race is up in two years. No. Okay. There's no Ward Two race. I'm searching for the next category. Ward Three. You gotta see Ward One. You got. Oh, that that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, we got Wu Tang Clan running for Ward Three. It's a lot of people. Wow! All right, so for those who don't know, Ward Three is the wealthiest uh, ward in uh, the nation's capital. Uh, the, the incumbent is Mary Che, who I—I'm not putting you on the spot. I said I think is racist, uh, and I think Mary Che is racist because she went after. It's a um, we have a, a, a long time um, uh, black. Uh, established in a city called Henry Soul Cafe. And Henry Soul Cafe had the audacity to uh, apply for, um, what do you call it? Um, it's not a grant, but a bid, a contract um, to feed the homeless. And uh, I want to make sure I'm getting the names right. Um, the organization um, that gives the food out there, the currently for DC Central Kitchen. DC Central Kitchen had a monopoly on it, it was 100%. And so they said, well, that was unfair. We, people have to open this up for a bid. And they bid, and then D.C. Central Kitchen got 50%, and Hidden Soul Cafe got 50%. She went after them with a vengeance. She called the Attorney General, had them investigated, because how could they possibly have gotten this bid successfully? You know, and um, Soul Food is very unhealthy, you know. And I'm like, yo, 
have you seen the Netflix special High on the Hog? I mean, like, you know, like, clearly, you know, with all these food deserts in the city, you're not concerned about the health and well-being of the dietary concerns of people in the city. Um, and then the D.C. Central Kitchen business model, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that they, they take donated food, the food that's left over from hotels and the restaurants, and they take it and preserve it um, and give it out. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. I hate to see food wasted. It's not garbage if it's just day-old bread and you're hungry. I mean, I'm, I'm all right with that. Uh, but you mean to tell me that homeless people don't deserve a, a home-cooked meal? Like, you can't get a home-cooked meal? You know, you only can have that? So, and she ducked into one of the vengeance. It was long. That's my two cents. And, it's, it's, and, of course, I got a personal vendetta with what I encounters uh, from, you know, the Amplified Noise and Mimic Act to Don't Meet DC when she said that our um, music was terrorizing um, people um, uh, in, in this city. Music was terrorizing people in this city, according to Mary, Mary Che. But it's only certain types of music. Uh, because when the um, the hockey team won the, uh, the national championship, there was no such complaints about um, uh, terrorizing the community then. You know what I'm saying? So me and Mary Che do not get along. Okay. I, I don't want to get into it, but uh, DC Central Kitchen is a good organization too. I'm not no disrespect to DC Central Kitchen. Right. I'm talking about Mary Che. They, they, they do a lot of good <laughs> things, and it's, they don't just repurpose leftover food. They do a lot of other things. So. I know. Thank you for correcting the record. Mary I don't doubt. I'm not knocking That's DC right. Central we Kitchen. We don't need to talk about DC Central Kitchen. Yeah, but shout out to the Henry Soul um, Cafe. And, uh, and I wonder why she's not running. I don't know, but you know, she's, she decided to. Um, she did to two not terms run. or three terms? Four terms. Four terms. So this yeah. has been a long relationship with Mary Che. That's four terms, four years. You do the math. Uh, uh, Mary Che, what can I say? Bye, Felicia. <laughs> All right. All right. So you should, why don't you read the candidates' names and then we'll decide which ones to talk about. We don't I don't know any of these. Nine this is for the wealthiest, the wealthiest ward in the nation's capital. I don't know of any of these names. So yeah, audience, can I say the, the leading candidates, what I think of Let's hear, yes. Let's hear who think of the, the audience. Who should we be talking about? The leading candidates, the coolest candidate is not a leading candidate. It's Henry Cohen. He's 18 years old. Who? Henry Cohen is 18 years Henry old. Cohen. He's dope, but he's you can run for a council at 18? Yes. Yes. I did not know that. I thought you had to at least be 21. No. Wait, why do you think he's liable? Because he's not, he's mostly been. Because he's a kid? He's also sort of been clear he's in it for the money. He's not raising any money. He said he wouldn't raise more than $500. So, like, you can't send any mail, and you can't talk to him, you can't hire staff. Does he smoke weed? I don't know. That's not part of his platform. I want a council member that openly smokes weed. All right. Um, he says the youngest is the most valuable, uh, Henry Cohen. Um, no, 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 not viable. He says he's, he's the dopest. The dopest. Okay. Yes. But that's who you vote. You, you, if you lived in War Three, that's who you would vote for? No, I wouldn't because I, I don't want my vote. It's a, it would be a throwaway. See, that's why we need ranked choice voting. Exactly. Okay. I've heard about that. All right. Uh, we have a Trisha Duncan. No one knows about Trisha? Uh, Trisha uh, lives in the Palisades neighborhood. She's been very active in the schools. People seem to have a lot of respect for what she's done there. She's the first time candidate has not been involved in D.C. politics before. That's pretty much what I know about Trisha. Anybody have? She's, she, Mary Che has said she, that's who she's going to vote. Vote, ladies and gentlemen. Vote. Be sure to vote. Mary Che, she said she's going to vote for Trisha, not because of her policy positions, but because of personality, which I will just say is a weird reason to vote. If you're voting for someone who's going to pass the laws that govern how we live, I don't care as much about their personality as about their policies. I don't care about the personality either. We shouldn't be into, um, uh, you know, a popularity contest. It's, I, like, like I said, I don't support candidates. I support policies. There we go. So you have to have a policy that speaks to me. So just to be clear, that's what Mary Chase said when she said she's voting for Trisha. So Mary Chase voted for Trisha. Mary Chase voting for Trisha, but since she's not going to campaign for her, she's just that's who she's voting for. But okay. Because of personality. Okay. Um, so, I, so the other two, Matt Fruman, who is a longtime resident, been very very active in uh, education advocacy in Ward Three, but also in a citywide organization called Coalition for DC Schools. 
he's on the board of an organization that supports affordable housing. I think it's called Lisner House, and they're bringing the first housing production trust fund funded project to Ward Three ever. So he is sort of considered the uh, the progressive that has the best chance to win. Okay, so Fruman is the progressive. Okay, oh, he's not he's not necessarily the most progressive person in the race. There are people in the race. I mean, Henry Cohen. Bo Finley, maybe even Ben Bergman might be, if you want, you know, did a progressive scale, might be more progressive, but none of those others that I just mentioned has a strong chance of winning. Of, okay, of so, so we got uh, Eric Goulet. Eric Goulet, and that's, that's, that is the one that we you know, hope does not win. Defer, I mentioned earlier, this outside conservative influence is spending a lot of money on Eric Goulet. Anthony Williams, are you a big fan of Anthony Williams? Of, of course not. He's the grandfather right. of, of, of um, gentrification. Oh, I, I knew that was the answer. I just was, you know, <laughs> so, he also uh, runs the he, Federal City Council, which is the unseen hand behind all of this. Well, well one, of, one of the mailers that Eric Goulet has is him sitting at a table with Anthony Williams. Do you need to know any more than that? Oh, okay. Well, I sat at a table with Anthony Williams one time, and people start treating me a lot different. But you, exactly. <laughs> so, I, I will just say, uh, Eric, Williams, uh, Eric Goulet was the mayor's budget director under Mayor Gray. Oh, there you had and, it. And I followed the city budget very closely in my former job, and I saw Eric Goulet up front, and I saw him do a number of things that, in my opinion, were both reckless and harmful to D.C. residents. So, I'll just give you one example. The city was coming out of the recession, money was tight, he was looking for savings. Rather than looking for savings by like raising taxes on rich people or whatever, and keep protecting benefits for low-income residents, he proposed a policy to make it harder for people, for immigrants who get health insurance for the city to, to maintain that insurance. He put up barriers knowing that it would be harder for them to keep their insurance, knowing that people would drop off. Within one year of that policy being enacted, the number of people in this program went from 25,000 to 15,000. So I'd like to say that, that thanks to Eric Goulet, 10,000 people, primarily immigrants, lost health insurance. He knew what he was doing. It was not a well thought out policy and clearly it was a harmful policy. Everybody say shame. 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 All right, uh, we have a, a booth. Is it Boo or Bay Finley? Bo. 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 Bo Finley. Bo Finley. Bo Finley. Okay. Yeah, he, he's, a, uh, he's been active in progressive circles. And I think a lot of people who are uh, consider themselves progressives, like Bo, I think I think they also just think he doesn't have a strong chance of winning. Well, you know, he's, he's one out of nine in the Wu Tang Clan running. It makes exactly. it very difficult. Um, Monty Monash, For, former Republican. Ooh, moving right along. Deidre Brown. She she comes from the real estate industry, and so she's not a big fan of Topa, for example. She's not a fan of Topa. Tenant office purchase. Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So she's pro um, 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 developer. I don't. We don't do landlords here. No one's lord over us. This is not um, feudal. Um, a feudal um, Europe. We're not serfs. You know. We need to change the language. Their own property, not you. You know. Um, so just put that out there. You. You. You know. It's like calling yourself a minority. All right. All right. Phil Thomas. Phil Thomas is uh, very close to Mayor Bowser. How close? Uh, he was her field director when she ran uh, in 2018. He's worked for the city government ever since then. Okay, I thought you were talking about like a relationship. Okay. Oh no, <laughs> very friendly, professional relationship. But I was close. like, I was like, Phil was Phil. All right, we haven't gotten into the attorney general. We have to also get to Ward Five. Um. And I can see how people have trouble with this because it's, it's, it is a big daunting to navigate. Uh, I'm going through, it's like listed through the precincts as I'm turning the pages because it's not giving me a full account because obviously um, it's assigned to the area because as you just pointed out, if I'm not War 3, I'm not going to get, you know. Well, it's daunting. I wouldn't say useless, but it's daunting, yeah. Um, so the attorney general race, first let's, Talk about who's not in the race. Kenya McDuffie, what do you think about what happened with Kenya McDuffie uh, being removed from the ballot? Who was leading the campaign for the Attorney General race? Um, well, let's start there. Sure, I guess I'd say two things. One is, we pass a law as a city to say, if you're gonna be the Attorney General, you are essentially the city's attorney, you actually need to be an attorney and have practiced law. And, and we set out in the law specific requirements. It's the only 
position in the city, the only elected position in the city that actually has requirements to qualify. And one of the other candidates, in fact, all the candidates looked at Candy McDuffie and said, you've been a DC council member, you've not been a practicing attorney, you don't meet the law's requirements. One of the candidates, Bruce Biver, decided to challenge him. The Board of Elections unanimously said that Kenny McDuffie was not qualified. When Kenny McDuffie went to the courts, they unanimously decided that he was not qualified. So it's pretty clear he didn't meet the requirements to be the Attorney General. I think he was treated poorly in that he shouldn't have been allowed to run a campaign for six months, raise that's, a million that's dollars, what I have a problem with. and then be told. Like, if you're applying to run for Attorney General where there are specific qualifications, the Board of Elections should look at you and say, do you meet the law's qualifications you can run or you shouldn't? They should have told him at the beginning rather than when they told him. But, yeah, but I don't think it was wrong to remove him. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, they're carrying like he lied on his application and stuff. Could you just clarify what the qualifications were that he didn't meet? That it says in the five of the last ten years, you essentially have to be a practicing attorney. You've and, been using your law skills in your job. And he was trying to make the argument that he was using his law skills in the capacity of, uh, of uh, a council, council member. member. Even though you don't have to be a lawyer to be a council member, you're not practicing law when you're a council member. You're writing law, but... Right. I mean, when you hear other, when you hear the other candidates talk, they're talk, talking about Supreme Court decisions. They're talking about court cases. They're just you can tell that they actually understand the law and use the law in their work in a way that Kenny McDuffie just now, has, could, hasn't been. Now, you have a question um, from the audience. What do you think of how he didn't do anything to try to stop the sale of the Howard and upzoning of the Howard University Divinity School? Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't. I don't think that had any, I don't think that was had any bearing on, 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 As on this member, one. There was like an effort to try to get him to get involved on the comprehensive plan. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of issues why he was a council member, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's not running for council anymore, so did he, you, he, he opposed the upzoning or he supported the upzoning? He supported it so that if Howard University Divinity School could be sold. And, and, and have so more debt development. Mm. That's a, that's a, I don't know nothing about that. And, and the, the neighborhood, um, um, the public housing neighborhood, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Brooklyn Manor. Uh, Brooklyn Manor, and that, that was a big issue for me because um, it was one of the last large apartment um, complexes that four families with, you know, with you know, four or five bedrooms there, and they was remodeling it and getting rid of those large bedrooms. I'm like, where are the families are supposed to go? Where's working class families supposed and to go? And he supported that. Too. And he supported that. Yeah. So I disagree with him. He did not him. fight for Brooklyn. And I disagree yeah. on a couple of things. I didn't like his vote on, on weed either. Yeah. Yes. So I'm familiar with Kenny McDuffie and, and I Google and it says here that he's an American lawyer. He is a lawyer. He just hasn't been practicing. Yes, he just hasn't been practicing. Yeah. And, and five of the last five of the last ten years. Yeah. That's what the law says. Uh, I don't want to give a, I want to give King a, sh a shout out right quick. Uh, again, he's partially responsible for saving uh, React Radio from being displaced, and he also introduced uh, the concept of racial equity uh, in this city, uh, racial equity DC, and we wanted to have that um, uh, that lens applied to um, all um, um, budgets in the city. And um, it led the mayor to create uh, an agency, a racial equity agency that has more um, symbolism, unfortunately, because it's remained um, unfunded. It's basically a paper tiger, but at least the conversation has started and we need to um, um, take it further. Um, I, I wanted to say real quick um, that this seemed like Phil left him hanging a little bit because wasn't it possible for the second most powerful man in the city to create uh, emergency legislation to clarify um, that uh, overstanding uh, concerning um, the, the rules regarding the eligibility of an attorney general? I, I think this that, was an interpretation of what was written, correct? I mean, the Board of Elections interpreted it and then the court interpreted it, so, like... He could have, he could have written a law to change it at any point in the last eight years. Right. I think it would have just been seen as interfering in an election. Because mm -hmm. if, if clearly the Board of Elections unanimously agrees, the court unanimously agrees, the law has been interpreted. You mean interfering like when we pass an a, a initiative and then this, and it passes exactly. overwhelmingly and then the council turns around and rescinds it? They never do despite that. Despite the voting? They don't do that. Yeah, yeah. you know. Did you, we have another question from the audience. So just to be clear, for the attorney general qualifications, is that just a D.C. thing? It's a D.C. It, thing. It's, so it's not federal. It's not I live in no. D.C., baby. Some other states, every state sets their own rules and they're there are other people like Tom Perez, who's running for governor of Maryland right now. 
had worked at the Department of Justice. He chose to run for Attorney General in Maryland and was kicked off the ballot for the exact same reason. He didn't meet that state's qualifications. So, so similar to judges, huh? Uh, do you have to? I don't know about judges. I think, any, I think anyone could be appointed. That's my point. We have a bunch of unqualified judges considering. It doesn't make any sense. But the Senate, the Senate determines that instead of the voters. So we have so we have three candidates left. So we got three candidates who actually are running for attorney general and have been practicing attorneys. And the top of the list uh, on the ballot is Brian Schwab. Yep. Any uh, thoughts on Brian Schwab? I already made my decision on mine. I don't know much about Brian Schwab though. Uh, he's he. I would say that Brian Schwab and Bruce Biver are both seen as the leading candidates. Ryan Jones is like a good person, but I think in general is not considered to be one of the leading candidates. We have a thumbs down from on Ryan Jones. Brian, Brian, Brian Schwab, thumbs up. I'm going. I'm going I'm with Brian. Brian Schwab. Thumbs up. Brian. Thumbs down. Brian Schwab. Brian Schwab is, is, has been a practicing corporate attorney. His family lives in Ward Three. He says the right thing, and he's a good progressive. He hasn't really been. There, he, does, he doesn't have a, a strong record of being engaged on the kind of issues that that we might care about as a city. He's just been a practicing corporate attorney. But if you read his answers or listen to him in a debate. He tends to say the right thing, and that's why he's been endorsed, for example, by um, by our Attorney General Carter. Yeah, he was. He's, he's, he's endorsed by the incumbent. That's all I know. Yeah. And I'm disappointed in our um, uh, incumbent, and that's why I'm, I'm not supporting uh, Brian Schwab. Um, I'm going with Ryan Jones, um, it's, and you just sealed the deal for me if he's the underdog in all of this. Um, he's young, Ryan. You should go for Bruce Biden. You, really? What's the issue? What's the issue? What's the issue that would make me switch from Ryan Jones to Bruce Biden? Ryan Jones, I've, I've asked him what his priorities are, or she does him also. He's, he, has, he doesn't have anything to say. He, he's just, it's all vague, it's all behind this guy. All of his, well, well, first I'll say what he, he spoke. He spoke at the Eaton Hotel this past week um, when Sharice Crawford had her, um, what was her event? Um, so Sharice Crawford Appreciation Day. And, uh, and uh, he spoke there, and he said that you know he wants to, um, he, he you know he wants to revamp um, uh, the judicial system. He said it's, it's racist, it's corrupt, and it needs to uh, be clean house. He wants to do that. Will he do that? I don't think so. Well, that's that got me excited. He said he wanted to clean well, house. He, he he has no management experience. Exactly. He's actually, uh, you're actually a, a, the boss of seven hundred. And he has a single, he's, he's a solo attorney, so he has no management. Well, see, that, that's a valid point. Now I'm going to change that, because when you say they had no ex manager experience, see, when I hear that, I'm like, well, how, there's only one way to get experience. Well, would you hire someone to manage 700 person law firm for the city if they've never managed more than one person before? Or would you hire someone who's actually managed somewhere else? And then, and then the other thing, I think even more importantly, look at his clients who he's represented. Yeah. That is all. That, that's all big corporations and and like the commanders and like you know it's not it's not the little guy. He is not. He might be the underdog in the race. Oh, you were working here. Mine's fine. He got he got he comes with pay. All right, I got a fire. I mean, just as a matter of practicality, and if to the extent that you think of elections as practical. The two leading candidates are Brian Schwab and Bruce Bible, and it's very, very likely one of the two of them will win, and that, that's probably, that's where I would say the conversation should go. Okay, and Bruce kind of You can just use the Yeah. You know, the show's been going on so long, you're killing the batteries in the microphone. <laughs> All right, so, you, who you got? I support Bruce Bible. You got Bruce Bible, who challenged uh, Kenya McDuffie, he got him kicked off the ballot. That's right. <laughs> Ed is a tough cookie, boy. Hey, that's, that's, that's a little courage. Right? It, is, it is a tough yeah, cookie. Like to, I mean, I like the fact that he read the law, he understood the law, and he wasn't afraid to apply the law. Seems, seems like, like a qualifying um, um, issue um, for the position. But when, when, I, Thank I you. heard what makes him so great. 
So uh, both Brian Schwab and Bruce Baila have been managing attorneys in big law firms, so they understand how law firms work. They've been able to manage them. They both qualify. They both talk a lot about criminal legal reform and in many ways talk about the same things. But Bruce Baila has actually been living that role rather than just talking about it. So Bruce Baila is a, uh, was, grew up in the South. His parents, he's a black man. His parents were active in the civil rights movement, so he sort of grew up in a period where he understood what it was like for the law not to be on your side. He went to law school with the encouragement of his father because he saw the power of the law to make life better for black people and other oppressed people. And since being a lawyer, he has focused his energy on consumer protection, civil rights, and voting rights. And he in fact left a purely corporate law firm to start a, a new law firm where he was the managing attorney, where the primary focus was uh, voting rights protection. Uh, Perkins Coie is a large firm, yes, and it's you know it, it's a for-profit firm. They charge the same ridiculous amount that any law firm charges, but they tend to work on behalf of Democratic candidates who are, of course, always under attack in elections when people try to you know not have Democratic votes counted. All right. So he's been he has been living a life as an attorney of fighting for civil rights, fighting for consumers, fighting for oppressed people. Um, and not just talking about it as a candidate. So we're here giving you an overview um, for the DC Uninformed um, Voters Guide, but we encourage you to become an informed um, voter before you make your final decision and go to the booth. So why don't you look some of these names up and read them for yourself, um, because I don't think it's fair that um, we're doing a snapshot and we making our selections and you are just gonna take our word for it. So look us up, verify this stuff. What's wrong? <laughs> well, of course, you know, you can trust me at Grey Old Truth is our product. You can trust this man's track record, of course. Um, but we just want to have a much more informed community. And that's what we've been doing this. We're trying to drum up interest for the uh, election and also get people more interested into who these people are. And, and know why you wanted to vote for them. But yes, uh, you definitely want to listen to Can I answer your question? Is it helpful? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, that's why you're here, because I value your opinion and your honest uh, analysis. And I appreciate you being here and taking time with us. I appreciate the conversation. Okay, but now we're going to get to the good part. The good part. Because you live in Ward 5. We are in Ward 5. I live in Ward 5. five. We're here in Ward 5. five. That's yes. right. Uh, in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Edgewood, North Michigan. Park. Yeah, all it's, that. It's all good. All that. The last, home of the last hospital to close in the, the nation's capital. Indeed. Okay. All right. So we have um, another Wu-Tang group running for this, this spot. Uh, on top of the ballot is Kathy Henderson. Um, that can't be the same Kathy I've been seeing on ballots all the time. Uh, it it's the can. same one. <laughs> all right. Yeah, when all it takes is 250 signatures to get it on the ballot. Wow. Can we, just, can we just talk about the four candidates that everyone considers and understands? Well, we, you know, we got, got to give her a two cent, though. Kathy Henderson. Anybody got anything on Kathy? Just the fact that she just, uh, she's just a perpetual candidate. Okay, she's a perpetual candidate. So no thumbs up on Kathy Henderson. We don't know much information. Look her up for yourselves. All right. Uh, check this one out. Check this one out. Gordon, the people's champion, Fletcher. So, Hold up. This dude, is he in a boxing match? Like, this dude <laughs> said, Gordon, the people's champion, Fletcher. And in this corner. <laughs> exactly. So, so one thing I learned after I read the ballot is that when you put your name on the ballot, they let you put whatever you want. As your name, so he was allowed to run as Gordon. People's what, what, what virtue do you think he he possesses to make him the people's champion? Well, he's a self-proclaimed people's champion. He, he's a self-proclaimed people's champion. Does it make you a little nervous when someone calls himself, decides, declares himself the people's champion? I don't know, because I got to give a shout out to Muhammad Ali, who was the people's champion, and he said that he called himself the greatest before he even believed it. I mean, Muhammad Ali could pull it off. Yeah, but so when he was saying he was the greatest, he was trying to convince himself. He was the greatest. So maybe he's trying to convince himself he's the people's, people's champion. But we said something off air that was very, yes. very colorful. So, so yes, I appreciate you bringing that up. So the one thing that we were talking about before we went on air is that in the last several debates that I've attended, Gordon Fletcher's made the comment that he believes the D.C. Council is moving too far to the left, and presumably he therefore is running to keep it from moving further to the left. Okay. What does that mean? The People's Champion mean? thinks the D.C. Council has gone too far to the left. How are you the People's Champion <laughs> and it's too left? Wow. 
There's a little, a little contradiction there. A little oxymoron there. There's a microphone that's now available to be passed around. I was just asking, what does it mean to be too left? Well, that's a good question for Barack Obama because he said the same thing. He said that he feels that the country's gone too far too far to the left. And I'm like, well, if the country has gone too far to the right, how do you straighten it up? You have to go left. Because clearly the country's gone too far right. I mean, really, you know. And what is too left? That's what you're really saying. What is too left? Too progressive, you know. You know, family leave is too much, you know. Guaranteed income is too much, you know. Um, equitably funding these schools so every child has the same uh, level of education opportunities that every other child does in the same. You know, um, we need an alternative to um, uh, policing, you know. Two left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, what else we got? We need, we need a progressive income tax but we'll to pay their share, you know. Yeah. Oh, that, I mean, you are hitting the nail on the head because he, he does not say what two left means and yet when you think about what the DC Council has done in recent years, like trying to make universal access to affordable childcare, raising taxes on millionaires, paid family medical leave, things that actually truly help people and address economic and racial inequality, he says that's too left. So clearly, um, the People's Champion uh, moniker is a red herring. All right, uh, we have Art Lloyd. Now, I love art. We're in art space, Brooklyn art space, but don't know much about Art Lloyd. Art Lloyd. He's, he's a nice guy. He cares a lot about the youth. Really nice guy. Really love him. Isn't really running a real campaign, but good guy. Not, not worth voting for, but really great guy. And he had the best line of the Ward 5 Democrats campaign, or the forum. They asked him, how do you feel about marijuana? And he stood there, he kind of looked and he thought, because everyone was kind of chuckling, and he said, if you smoke, you smoke. And it brought the house down. And that was it. You smoke, you smoke. Ah, okay, maybe I can smoke with him. All right. Now, next on the ballot is someone that we all know and love, and they're going to get a good round, resounding round of applause. In this corner, we have Zachary Parker. You, we have Zachary Parker signs out here. Um, Zachary Parker came on the React Radio. He requested to come on React Radio. Anybody wants to know, uh, he requested to come on React Radio because I don't chase these guys. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I'd rather do this. Yeah. You know, um, because they all kind of like got their own agenda, and I, I, I'm not here to take up all my time to give one on one with Wu Tang Clan, and half of y'all are not even worth my my time. But um, <laughs> people's champion. Okay. Um, Zachary won me over because his was a guy that, and I urge y'all to go watch our interview, it's also on this Facebook page, just scroll down for the videos. Uh, but one of the issues that caught my attention is when he's talked about the inequities in our city. You know, you, you're gonna get me when you talk about the inequities in our city. Because I feel like that's like the elephant in the room. Um, or if you're not talking about the inequities, that means you must be in support of the status quo. To left, you know? To left. Uh, Zachary talks a lot about trying to address this, the systems that failed his family. You know, a healthcare system that didn't, uh, that, yeah. didn't that failed his uh, one of his brothers who died of. We both have that in common. He lost a sibling to the sick care system. I lost a sister to the sick care yeah. system. So, and he so talks about a brother, there. brother who works full time and a job that doesn't have health insurance and doesn't make enough to make ends meet, just not treated right by the economic system. And that he wants to create a ward five where everyone has a chance to thrive. Let that be a lesson to everyone that health insurance is not health care. My sister had, um, she raved about her health insurance until she needed it because insurance covers this and doesn't cover that. And that that didn't get covered killed her. All right? Sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, and also to the um, Zachary Parker's family as well. Uh, next on the top of the ballot, we got another moniker. And in this corner, we have Gary Tutu Johnson. I just want to say about Zachary Parker, the you're, this is by a oh. pro pro Zachary crowd. Pro Zach. Pro Zach. Everyone, as you said, everyone needs to everyone needs to investigate the candidates. But it's also just important to note that Zachary Parker has more volunteers, more donors, more, more endorsements, donors, 
more endorsements. More endorsements than all the other candidates combined. combined. From environmental groups, from labor unions, from the teachers, from elected officials, from social justice organizations. Firefighters, yeah, he just... There's a mic in the audience. Every single category of endorsements, he is the leader. Um, yes? What did he do before running? He's a current State Board of Education representative for War 5. He's a former teacher, and when he left teaching, he became an education consultant. Mm. So he's been working for the last several years as a consultant, primarily focused on working with administrators in D.C. schools to improve their performance. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or Prozac? All right. Prozac. Prozac. And in this corner, we have Gary Tutu Johnson. I don't know Gary. What do these dudes get these names? What's it say? It no. says Gary Tutu Johnson. T U T U? T O T O. T O. It's, it is, it is, uh, oh wait, is it? Or is it Toto? No, it is Tutu. It is Tutu. How about because I've met a few, I've met a few Gary Johnson supporters. He's from DC. He seems like a good guy, but. I'm not voting. Really I'm sorry. I don't know what he stands for. I'm not voting for anybody going by Tutu. I haven't even seen. I haven't seen him in a debate even. I'm sorry, Gary. Tutu ain't working for me, bro. All right. Tutu, <laughs> tutu, tutu going once, going nice. twice. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. All right. I guess the next contender, uh, a challenge. What is this? It's still a contender. Uh, it's Faith Gibson Hubbard. Um, she is popular among some of my friends. Uh, but she's endorsed by the Washington Post, and that leaves a bad taste in my mouth. That is a bad sign, yes. Yeah? Generally. Yeah, generally. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. Uh, so, Faith, I'm sorry, that, that, that's, that's, that's a uh, problem for me. Um, do we know anything about her politics beyond that? She's a mayor uh, appointee, and, and a lot of her support is coming from. Okay, so she's a status quo. Yeah, faith. All right, gotta keep the faith. Vincent Orange, and he got V O on his. It's an orange V O. V O. Um, I like V S O P, but I'm not that keen on V O. Vincent Orange leaves a bad taste in my mouth on a personal level. Uh, my son went to um, Chance Academy, which is, a, uh, um, which is a, um, an external homeschool collective, uh, which is next door to his house, his house. And he would rave, rave, you hear me, about parents parking in front of his house, not his driveway, not his driveway, his house, when they drop or pick up their kids. I'm like, ain't you a council member? And you live next door to a school? And that's your issue? <laughs> okay, bro. <laughs> I just want to say, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's my personal thing on, on him. And then we can start talking about his voting record. His voting record is not um, 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 transformative, to say the least. Uh, post paid family leave. Uh, post, uh, yes, post that. And he was head of the DC um, Chamber, um, of Chamber of Commerce. And that is, he left. Did he lose or he left? He left. He left. He lost the primary to Robert White. Oh, he had lost. He had lost the primary. He lost the primary. He was and a then, lame duck, still in office until the, you know, the next year. And, and then he got the job. He got the job. Did he get fired from the Congress or he leave there, leave there too? The Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he sort of widely reported that people were not very happy with his performance. I heard that he was so not I very happy. I think he resigned. I yeah, know, so I think it was fired. a forced resignation. But yeah, one of the resignation, like, please resign. I want your resignation. Exactly. Yeah. Mine? <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan of Vincent Orange, um, um, you know, and, and he's also one of those perennial candidates. Yes. You know, uh, he's done at least two terms. He's been... And he's ran abroad at least five times. He's run many, many times. And I think he thinks his name recognition um, is enough. He always thinks his name recognition is enough. Yeah. You know? I mean, for, for me, one of the issues to crystallize is that in all the debates and his literature, uh, he takes credit for the fifteen dollar minimum wage that we have in the city, which um, passed while he was on the council and while he headed the committee that oversaw the minimum wage. So you might think there is a connection, but those who were around during the debate know that it, exactly what happened, and it had nothing to do with Vince Orange. It happened. It came from the people. The people's champion, um, not Gordon, but <laughs> other people's champions actually 
gather signatures to put a $15 minimum wage on the ballot, and also to make sure that it was a $15 minimum wage for tip workers. The mayor didn't like that. And to, to subvert that ballot initiative, she asked the council to pass a $15 minimum wage with a lower minimum wage for tip workers. It, so it came from the mayor and it passed the council unanimously. The committee that Vince Orange chaired played no role in bringing the $15 minimum wage. And yet if you went to a debate, you would think that, the, that he was the fighter for the workers and that the $15 minimum wage wouldn't have happened without him when in fact it really did happen without him. Did he invent the internet too? Um, he did. Though he keeps claiming he wants to give every kid internet access. He keeps claiming he wants to give internet, every kid internet access and a laptop without acknowledging the programs we already have for that that just aren't being funded. He's and a he's like, out, he, yeah, he's a little out of touch. He also talks about we keep putting a hundred million dollars into the housing production trust fund, and the mayor just passed a budget that has five hundred million for the housing production trust fund. Like. 100 million was a few years ago. <laughs> He's just not been paying attention. Do you think it's a good sign or a bad sign when you see a candidate putting up their own signs, their own, their own campaign signs? I mean, I like candidate hustles. So as long as they're not the only person putting up their signs. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> have some friends with. I saw, I saw Vincent Orange by himself putting up his, his, own, <laughs> his own signs. You, think you saw that up? too? Do we okay. think he put up every single one? I saw, I saw this and it just looks sad to me. I just thought it was sad. It sounds like he has been the only one. Is he by himself? I don't know. He, he, was by, he was by himself when I saw him. There's a lot of signs up. But I saw Trey on by himself. I saw Trey on by himself, but he was knocking on doors. He was going to door to door. And that, I thought, was inspirational. So I had a direct opposite feeling. When I saw this, and I felt sad. When I saw Trey on, I felt inspired. He was knocking on the door. The other guy was yeah, putting up his signs. I don't think V.O. has been knocking on doors. All right, I'm having difficulty navigating the, the, the official voters guide. Um, what? Um, We're down to Ward One. That's the last race. Ward One. Yeah. Maybe that's because it's in the in the. It's the most The beginning. And it's in Spanish. Yeah. Okay. Um, you want to help me out here, Sam? You the you the you the tough guy here. Find me the listing for um, um, World War candidates. You know you know all the names. There's three, there's three candidates. Okay, yeah. See, Ed knows. That's the hook. So, it, it, see, when Ed ran, he should have put Ed knows was it. You know, <laughs> then I I don't know. Maybe the people. Can. <laughs> uh, so the three candidates are the incumbent, Brianna Doe. And she has two challengers, Salah Zapari and Sable Harris. Okay, um, my Brandon the Doe story is that when Don't Me DC took off, uh, before Don't, Don't Me DC took off, we had um, the, we held the first rally in the rain um, at 7 T Street. It was only a couple hundred people there. And uh, Robert White and Brianna the Doe showed up. I didn't call them. I didn't um, um, uh, request for their uh, attendance. They showed up. And you can imagine how hard it is to get a council member to show up that's not running for mayor. Uh, and these two showed up. And um, so she got my, um, uh, my attention when she did that. And then her voting record uh, has been on the progressive side um, since that time. She's also um, uh, sponsored the Harmonious Living Bill Act, um, which is one of the great uh, direct um, things I, I think came out of the Don't Mute DC, and for those who don't haven't heard of Don't Mute DC, it's basically um, the uh, uh, tool that turned gentrification on its head uh, in the nation's capital and around the country when they were trying to silence the indigenous music uh, of, the, of the people here for the benefit and comfort of those who are moving here. Uh, and uh, one speaker got unplugged. Uh, that was playing this indigenous art form called Go Go, uh, doing business hours for 20 years, and it set off a small fire that lit the um, the, um, the, um, the asses of the masses. And um, Brianna Doe, Hormones Living Act, um, was basically saying that if you move next door to a church, for example, you can't complain about tambourines on Sunday. So. Uh, and, and, and it goes further than that. It creates um, soundproofing uh, for new, um, new 
new structures because the, um, the owners should be on the developers who make cheap housing and you can hear your neighbor. You should, you know, you should, they have the technology to make more soundproof um, um, structures. So that's uh, big for uh, Brianna Doe. And she also um, signed on um, to property tax abatement for uh, uh, Sankofa Video Bookstore because uh, I think property tax is one of the last vestiges of redlining legally uh, because if, it, if the property tax can continuously escalate, even if you own your property, it can become unaffordable to maintain that property. And I think that we need to create some legislation to address that. I think it should be a property tax cap. Uh, I personally think that whatever your property value was when you purchased it, your property tax should be capped at that amount until they change its hands. Um, so, um, Shout out to Brandon though. Uh, we have a mic in the audience. And it, and yeah, that's a that's a. I think HOA fees are probably more dangerous than tax. Yeah, and I'm H sorry. HOA fees, homeowner association, condo fees. I wouldn't say more. I would say just as yes. All right. So uh, you know when we talked about the mayor, I said I, if you're asking for more than two terms and you really have to demonstrate that you've done a good job. Brianna Doe is running for a third term. <coughs> she's she's done a really good job. In addition to the things that you mentioned. Uh, one of the things I did in my prior job was help help point out that the city had spent a billion dollars in business tax and quote unquote incentives to bring high tech companies to the city, and our own chief financial officer said it was entirely wasted money uh, because it ha hadn't created new jobs; it had just put more money in the pockets of these corporations. And when we went to the DC Council to find a champion to say let's get rid of this and put the money somewhere else, the only person who responded was Brianna Doe. She championed the legislation. She coasted close those loopholes, all the funding, all the money went to things like improving uh, high quality child care and homeless services. Um, so I think Brianna Nadeau gets it. Thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs up. up. Brianna Nadeau. I wish I was in Ward 1 ward to, one. to vote for her. Uh, you have, who, we, have, we, we have a Ward 1 resident and who doesn't want to speak? <laughs> Cause that's because she's a, she's, she's a newly um, 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 government employee now. I see. Yeah. All right. So, who's the other? Who's the other two? Can so, two other two bums. I mean, the other two candidates. Second is Salah. Salah. So, I think it's Salah. I don't know. Salah Zapari. It's a beautiful name. It is a beautiful name. He is a uh, he's a former police officer. He's a former independent. He he only recently registered as a Democrat, um, and he also has it's been discovered in his. He is one of the people who believes we need four thousand cops, which you know we talked about earlier. Was yeah, I kind of figured that when you say he was a. Former yeah. police officer. Uh, he also just has had a lot of a actual Republicans closely affiliated with his campaign. I was about to say that. I always cringe when I hear independent because oftentimes independent is a ruse because to, to, to hide your Republican tendencies. So you know you're not going to win as a Republican, so you just say I'm an independent so you can come off like you, um, yeah. Manchin. What's that dude's name from West Virginia? Joe Manchin. Joe, yeah. yeah, whatever. So, uh, I was told, someone in the audience said it's not, not just any old Republican, but Republicans who are very much at the heart of Trumpism uh, have been very connected to his campaign. I don't think there's any distinction. You know, the Republican, Republican that's the name is Liz Cheney, you're, you're a Republican. He also got a Washington Post endorsement, so. Oh, there you have it. There you go. WAPO, WAPO. And who's the last one? Uh, the third is Sable Harris, first time candidate, and um, I think falls more in the progressive camp, but has in my opinion, not run a really strong campaign, and I've not seen her uh, take strong positions on issues. I, for example, was in a conversation with her and asked her how she was going to, whether she would vote for Initiative 82 to raise wages for tip workers, and whether she would support it if it got passed. And her answer, as a candidate, was, boy, that's a really hard issue. That's a tough one. I'm going to have to think about it. It's like you don't run for office unless you were able to take, you know, take a position on the leading issues in the city, in my opinion. Well, Ed, you have ran for office. Um, um, give a little snapshot of your experience uh, or what you took from 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 it. Because you, you you said I've heard you said a couple times tonight that haven't run a strong campaign. I think uh, that you have ran a strong campaign. So I would love to hear what your experiences has has, has taught you or informed you uh, about running a strong campaign. Uh, thank you. Well, I ran. I, I did run the last two cycles, and unfortunately, did not win. Uh, I think among the things that are that I, I learned is that it it really is important to go and, and knock on as many doors as possible and talk to voters. Um, to not necessarily think that you have all the wisdom and all the answers. That you really get to know the city well by being out in every neighborhood and uh, talking to people and truly listening. Uh, and then the other thing I think you have to do is to to be courageous as a candidate the way you would want to be courageous. 
as an elected official and not just um, speak to the to the whatever audience you're you're at that uh, at that moment. So I hear in a number of debates, someone will ask a question and you can sort of tell what they want, and some candidates will just feed back to that person exactly what they wanted, even though if the person were asking a different question or a different forum, they would answer it in a different way. And then there are other candidates who say, I know you don't necessarily, you're not gonna love my answer, but I wanna tell you why this is where I stand, and those are the candidates that I think we need to support, because those are the ones who we know when push comes to shove and they have a tough vote on the DC Council, they're going to vote the way that they actually campaign, rather than go with the way the wind's blowing or crumple under pressure and not take the courageous votes that we need them to take if we're going to address things like our education inequities and the tremendous wealth gap between white and black residents. And there you have it, and with some of that wealth gaps, 81 um, multiples uh, in difference. Um, DJ One Love, who provided uh, the audio here for this illustrious production tonight, thank you. So, Ed, uh, what was your personal biggest hurdle when you were running? My personal biggest hurdle? is that I'm not necessarily the most outgoing person. <laughs> so, the first time I was in a room and realized I had to like go up and talk and say shake hand with every single person in the room is hard. And then it's also a little bit weird. So you see in this room, people can't see, but there are people who are, who are wearing uh, shirts for one candidate, it says Team Zachary. Like when you're the candidate and you have to like wear a button and a shirt with your name on it, it's just, it's not very humble, right? So you have to, you just have to be able to stand up in front of a crowd and say why well, you think you're the best uh, and why someone else is not the best. And that's just not the normal way that we interact with each other, right? You don't usually walk into a room and say, I'm the best and everyone else is not so good, right? But as a candidate, you have to do it. And you have to believe it. And you have to do it every single day of the campaign, which is hard. I never heard it put that way, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that, that speaks to your humanity. Uh, so it also speaks to the fact why it's more assholes when they're <laughs> good guys. Exactly, because they really think they are the best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got any more comments from the audience before we get out of here? All right, so thank y'all for joining us here tonight. And uh, uh, come back on Monday. Uh, we'll be having um, all of the uh, mayor candidates, uh, even um, the pro police, um, um, James, what is his name? James Butler. James Butt. Um, <laughs> so James Butt, uh, the incumbent, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Mira Bowser, Robert White, and Treyon White, both whites, uh, will be joining us. We'll be talking about uh, food equity in Washington, D.C. And so join us Monday at 7.30. Uh, this is sponsored by the uh, Community uh, Food Co-op. Community Co-op, please correct me if I'm wrong, but drinking framework. Uh, but you can see the information listed here on React Rail's Facebook page. Hope to see you guys back here on Monday. Uh, early voting starts today. Started today. But I would like to do it the old-fashioned way. We like vote on uh, election day on June 21st. All right. Yeah, you know. You can do it. You know, hopefully it won't be no, no egregious long lines. There will not. Oh, one of the things we didn't miss that one of the things we didn't talk about, they, they have these new um, ballot boxes Drop all over the city. That's right. You want to talk about that before we go? Uh, you just said it. It's just new yeah, to me. It's what, like, this is the first time, right? No, I, no they, did it, they did it two years ago. They did it two years ago? Yeah, there's one, like three blocks from here. I don't know how many there are. There's a whole bunch. Uh, I think multiple in every single ward. You don't have to worry about whether the post office will deliver it. You can just deliver it to the drop box. I think that's a great way to promote voting. Absolutely. You know, just because um, whether I use that service or not, I see the ballot boxes. I see the signage. I see they should list some of the more candidates on them. But you know, they it's encouraging. It's reminding that the, the election is is here. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that this was election is profound because. Because we have so many competitive races and it really does come down to people with different values and the outcome of the election could really shape whether the, we move forward as a city to tackle some of our biggest inequities or whether we just cling to the status quo. So is it going to be an Uber ride or are we going to take the keys? This is We Act Radio, Ed Lazier, and your organization now? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> He's formerly of the DC Fiscal the DC Policy, Policy Institute. Now he's his own man. His own man. This has been Kimon Freeman, Anger Black Man Therapy, representing We Act Rail, broadcast live from the Victor L. Uh, Selman Gallery here in Brooklyn, Washington, D.C. Do something.